For the rest of you, let's take out our Bibles and open up to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy chapter 2. For those of you that like to plan ahead or chart the course ahead, uh, kudos to you. Um, doing the same thing as we look at 2025 as a church and putting some things together. And basically, we're going to be finishing up 2 Timothy in the month of November. In the month of December, which is the Advent Christmas season, we're going to be looking specifically at a passage from Isaiah that talks about the coming Messiah and connecting Isaiah to the coming of Jesus. Then in January, we're going to be starting a series through the book of Hebrews in the New Testament, and then James, and that will take us to the summer. So finishing up 2 Timothy, Isaiah, some prophetic teachings regarding Christmas and the Messiah in December, then Hebrews, and then James. But this morning, for our purposes together, we're in 2 Timothy chapter 2. We're going to be looking at verses 14 through 26. So if you can find verse 14, that is where we are going to begin together. When I was a young boy, my parents would take me on Wednesday nights to a local church where I was a part of a ministry called Awana. And many of you in this room perhaps were a part of Awana as well. And it's a very strange word, is it not? Awana? And I went to Awana for a long time before I really understood what Awana even meant. And go to verse 15 of our text. I knew that we were going to, or I said we were going to start in 14, and we will in just a second. But in verse 15, the Apostle Paul writes to Timothy, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. So verse 15 is going to be kind of like our launching off verse. And Awana, from that children's ministry, means approved workmen are not ashamed. Awana. Approved workmen are not ashamed. And that word comes from verse 15. Thus the title of the message this morning, an approved worker. Most jobs have some kind of a performance review or an evaluation so you can determine whether you're doing a good job. Are you satisfactorily um, fulfilling your responsibilities? I want us to look at this passage through the lens of kind of a, a review that Paul has for Timothy in regard to Christian ministry and Christian faithfulness. And Paul is telling Timothy some certain things that he needs to be remembering and he needs to be communicating these things to other workers so that they can be remembering how they can be an, a faithful worker and actually one who is an approved worker. And if you want to be a volunteer in the school system or if you want to be a chaperone on a field trip, you have to go through the process of becoming an approved Worker, You have to fill out a form, you have to go through a background check. And so Paul has this whole notion of an approved worker for the kingdom of God. And so in a sense, I want us to see the four things that I'm going to draw out from this text as a bit of a checklist, even though I don't like that word checklist, because these things are going to be coming from within us as followers of Jesus Christ. So we're not just checking a box. But I think they're helpful things for us to notice in regard to what Paul was telling Timothy an approved worker really is all about. And so what are these characteristics? In verse 14, Paul writes to Timothy and says, remind them of these things. Well, whenever you start looking at a text that in this case is in the middle of a chapter, it can be confusing. Remind them, well, remind who? And I would direct our attention back to verse 2 of this same chapter, where Paul says, And what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to faithful men or entrust to faithful women. Remember, the whole series that we're working through is called Pass the Baton. And so Paul is encouraging Timothy to pass on the good news of Jesus, the gospel, 
to reliable people who will then be able to pass the baton on to other people. And so Paul says, remind these faithful leaders of these things and charge them before God to do what is then to follow. And so there is a strong exhortation and a strong encouragement from the Apostle Paul to Timothy, but not just to Timothy, to other faithful workers. And so this is interesting because Paul is in prison waiting to be killed or martyred for his love for Jesus and his commitment to the gospel. And he writes this very personal letter to Timothy. And yet, in God's sovereignty, it has become a part of our scriptures, a part of the canon of scripture. And so we have the benefit of reading a very personal letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, and we are able to glean incredible truths from this very personal letter. And others in the first century were also able to glean incredible truth, and some of them were going to be these other faithful workers that Timothy was supposed to pass this information down to as well. So in verse 15, we get to this very important verse that is serving as our launching off point, and he says, do your best to present yourself. Now that whole idea of presenting oneself has in the background the theme of coming before a judge, presenting oneself before a judge. And so my first point is in connection with that, and that is this, that an approved worker understands accountability, that Paul has been entrusted with the gospel. He's going to be accountable for what he has done with that trust. Timothy has been entrusted with the gospel, and he is going to be held accountable. And so Paul says to Timothy, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. We can probably all remember circumstances of our growing up years where our parents would go away, maybe for an evening date, and they would leave us home alone. And they would tell us what time they were going to get home. And so we knew that there was a time of reckoning where the kitchen would need to be cleaned up or the bedroom would need to be picked up or the toys would need to be put in their place, right? Sometimes as followers of Jesus Christ, we forget that we are going to be accountable for the gifts that God has given us for what he has entrusted into our care. And in the context of this, it's the gospel. It's the very message of Jesus Christ. And so we need to remember, just like Timothy was going to be reminded, that at some point, we will present ourselves to God. Now for Christians, it's not an issue of whether they're going to be saved or not. That issue has been settled because of God's grace and the faith that we put into Jesus as our Savior. But there are scriptures that talk about rewards. There are scriptures that talk about we will be rewarded according to what we have done. And so Paul is highlighting this idea of presentation because it's very easy for us to lose the very seriousness of our calling as those who have been called to follow Jesus. It's very easy for us to forget the seriousness of being entrusted with the good news of Jesus, which is actually the best news. There is no better news than Jesus. And through the Holy Spirit, he has gifted you in a myriad of ways, and someday there will be a presentation of your life and my life in front of the true judge. It's a good thing to remember, this presentation, because it helps us to stay away from getting slack in our responsibilities. Look what he continues to say 
after he says, present yourself as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. A worker, a laborer. Many of you are going to get up tomorrow morning and you're going to go to work. And remember the images that we saw last Sunday in relation to our walk with Jesus? One is a soldier. We are soldiers in God's army. And remember how we talked about the incredible discipline that soldiers undergo? And how we as followers of Jesus Christ need to consider our life in Jesus with that same type of discipline? One of the images was an athlete. And even if you're not an athlete, there is still the power of that image to be disciplined in your walk with Jesus. And then in verse 6 of chapter 2, he talks about this image of a farmer, a hard-working farmer. Paul is a really hard worker. And yet he has this understanding, and we looked at this recently, about we work hard as followers of Jesus. And yet the wonderful thing is, it's actually the power and the grace of Christ working in us. It's not just us doing the best we can with what we have. It's us being people in Christ through faith, empowered by his spirit. And so remember how we talked about you can look back on your life and you can see how you were able to come through things that you, were never, you would never be able to come through on your own, in your own strength. But it was the strengthening grace of Jesus that got you through those particular situations. So Paul in this letter is constantly highlighting the need to be vigilant, alert, committed to the gospel, and a hard worker with the knowledge that at some point there's going to be accountability in this whole thing. This past week, uh, we had some interaction with my daughter who lives in Albuquerque with her husband. And several months ago, they had their house, well, it wasn't broken into, but someone tried to break into their house. So they got one of those ring doorbells with the camera in the front. And so earlier this week, Abby happened to see on her video screen, uh, a truck driving down the road and people walking by and there were packages being stolen from the doorsteps. In fact, I asked her for a video, and so there's the truck, and they're just kind of going along this road, and there's a person on this side, there's some people on the other side, and they were able to capture this in multiple videos, multiple packages being stolen, multiple packages being put in the back of this truck. My daughter Abby is calling the Albuquerque Police Department, which is not known for its real speedy timeliness. And so she's, she's saying, there are people stealing packages on my street. And no one ever showed up to check on this whole thing. So my daughter got home from school. She has this video. And she starts going to the neighbors, ones where she saw that they had packages stolen. And she was wanting to hold these thieves accountable. She's wanting to do the right thing. And so she goes up to the neighbors and she finds out that those are honor students from Sandia High School oh, no. and they were picking up food donations for a Thanksgiving meal. <laughs> <laughs> so her desire to hold thieves accountable was kind of thrown on its head. But she did say one of the positive things that emerged from that whole situation was she got to know some of the neighbors that she really didn't get to know before. And this whole thieves stealing things from your front porch turned into a pretty powerful neighboring moment. So there's that. Um, we are going to be home accountable, okay? Uh, those guys weren't, and they shouldn't be. They were out just doing a wonderful thing, and people were donating food. But there will be a place for our accountability. Secondly, Paul says that an approved worker uses scripture correctly. Look what he says in verse 15 again. This is our jumping off verse. I'm going to read it again. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed. And then he says this, 
rightly handling the word of truth. To rightly handle the word of truth literally means to cut it straight. My wife is a third grade teacher, and I'm amazed when I watch her prepare things for her classroom. At night, a lot of times, she's just working, preparing things for her third graders. And a lot of times, it will involve scissors. And she can just take out a pair of scissors, and she can just cut oh so straightly, like it's nothing. And if I take out a pair of scissors, it's absolutely embarrassing what comes out. I do not have that gift. But with the word of God as a pastor and a teacher, I am called to rightly handle the word of God. I am called to cut it straight, which means in the King James Version, it says rightly dividing. And my grandmother always read the King James Version. And when I was real young, we would read that a lot. And when I was studying for this passage, I was thinking, rightly handling, rightly handling. And I was thinking back, that's got to be rightly dividing in the King James. And it is. Cut it straight and say it straight. Cut it straight and say it straight. What's the problem in Ephesus in the first century? There's a group of false teachers who are getting caught up in quarrels, arguments, babbling about certain words esoteric conversations that are leading people away from Jesus. And Paul says to Timothy, if you want to be an approved worker, cut it straight and say it straight. Cut it straight and say it straight. Look what he goes on to say in verse 16. But avoid, because this is what the false teacher was doing, irreverent balance. For it will lead people into more and more ungodliness. And then verse 17 has a horrific medical image that Paul wants Timothy to get in his mind. And I'm not going to show pictures of this, but you need to think about the worst infection you've ever seen. Maybe it was on your body. Maybe it was on someone else's body. But he uses the word gangrene. Their talk will spread like gangrene. They're not cutting it straight and saying it straight. They're cutting it in ways that suit their agenda. Their cut is all crooked. And they're leading people to strike. And Paul likens that to a gangrenous infection because that's exactly what it's doing to the church. It's destroying the very health of the first century church in Ephesus. And so Paul doesn't mince words. He's serious about Jesus. He's serious about the gospel. He's serious about the church. So he says, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, that this teaching is the nastiest infection you could ever think of. And if there's going to be cutting it straight and saying it straight, it's get rid of the infection. Get rid of it. I don't know what song that is, but that's kind of cool. <laughs> <laughs> Avoid irreverent babble, for it will lead people into more and more ungodliness, and their talk will spread like gangrene. And then he names two people. Now... Sometimes we think it would be great to have our name in the Bible, right? These are two instances where it's, it's not a good thing. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus. Hymenaeus is mentioned in 1 Timothy. If you go way back to our study of 1 Timothy, chapter 1, verse 20, Paul said, Some have made shipwreck of their faith. Among them are Hymenaeus and Alexander. Whom I have handed over to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. So evidently, Hymenaeus is still doing his thing. Some people are really slow learners. 
Hymenaeus is in the slow learner category. Paul hands him over to Satan with the hope that he will eventually be restored. But obviously when Paul is writing 2 Timothy from prison in Rome, awaiting his death, Hymenaeus is the, the blockhead that he's always been. So he needs to keep praying for Hymenaeus. Because they're not handling the word of God in an approved way. Among them are Hymenaeus and Philetus, who have swerved from the truth, not a straight cut, saying that the resurrection has already happened. Think about this for a moment. We don't know exactly all of the false teachings in first century Ephesus, but this gives us a clue. That Hymenaeus, Philetus, and others were saying that the resurrection has already happened. Hmm, what could that possibly mean? Some people think this, that you know when a person gets baptized and they go under the water and they associate their life with the death and burial of Jesus Christ, and then they come out of the water and are identifying with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Some think that the false teachers in Ephesus were saying that when people are made new in Christ, that that actually is the resurrection that we're still awaiting for when Christ returns. So I want you to think about this for a moment. We've prayed for a lot of people in this room this morning who are walking through some really difficult days with their physical health. Imagine if I was preaching to you this morning and saying to you that the resurrection has already happened. That really, it's here now. And there's nothing to look forward to in regard to the resurrection later. When I go to the hospital and I'm praying for people who are suffering, that wouldn't be good news to them. And it's not good news to me now, even though I'm able to be here this morning and I'm not admitted in the hospital. Our hope in Christ has at its core the resurrection, which is why you can have the Spirit of God dwelling in you now. Our Christian faith and our walk with Jesus has at its core the hope of the resurrection to come when Christ returns. And the dead in Christ will rise first with glorified bodies that aren't still suffering with the things that we're suffering with now. And so many think that a part of this false teaching in Ephesus was the resurrection has already happened. That's not good news to me. And it wasn't good news to Paul. Because what was about to take place for Paul? He was about to be killed. And his hope in the days awaiting his martyrdom was resting in Christ. Christ crucified. Christ <coughs> risen. Christ coming again. Cut it straight. Thirdly, an approved worker, according to Paul, in his letter to Timothy, and now in his letter to us, an approved worker pursues holiness. Verse 19 says, But God's firm foundation stands. That's a reference to church, Christ's church. God's firm foundation stands, bearing this seal. And there are two sayings in quotes. The first is this. The Lord knows those who are his. And let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. So Paul uses this image of the church in this particular text. And he describes this foundation that has two inscriptions. Over the summer, we took a family vacation to Chicago, and we did an architectural tour on the Chicago River, and we got to see the wondrous architecture of the city of Chicago. If you've never done that, I would encourage it. It's amazing. And on many of the old buildings in downtown Chicago, there is a cornerstone with some kind of a inscription. Perhaps the person who designed that building or the owner of the building or something like that. 
Paul is saying that the church has a really solid foundation. It's God's firm foundation. And he gives two inscriptions. Now, without going too far into the weeds, I need to let you know where these two inscriptions come from because it's helpful for us to understand the background and the basic point that Paul is putting forth here. The first quote, the Lord knows those who are his, is a quote from Numbers in the Old Testament, chapter 16, verse 5, but caveat, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament. So there's Hebrew and there's Greek. Paul is using the Greek translation. But that text is about a man named Korah who rebelled against Moses and Aaron because he wanted to have the same kind of priestly leadership that Aaron had. So Korah, along with a few others, rose up in rebellion. And so one of the reasons Paul chooses that story is because he sees people like Hymenaeus and Philetus as rising up from within the church with a rebellious spirit and they're challenging authority. The second quote, let everyone who names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity, comes from Isaiah chapter 26, verse 13, from the Greek translation of the Old Testament, which is why if you just go back and do our Old Testament, it doesn't read exactly that way. It's a different text that Paul is using. But once again, his argument is that there are these people who are not using scripture in the right way. They're not calling upon the name of the Lord in the proper way. And they are living rebelliously against the authority that God has put in charge in the church. Namely, Paul and then Timothy, in the case of Ephesus in particular. And then he goes in verse 20 into another Illustration. The church has its foundation with these inscriptions. Now verse 20, now in a great house, a big house. Remember that old song? Some of you might remember that. Uh, big, big house. Uh, lots and lots of, I don't know, remember. Room. There you go. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver. Think about your house. Think about your fine china that you might bring out when guests come over. But there's also... Wood and clay. Some for honorable use, some for dishonorable use. So Paul is saying, think about a big house. You've got really nice stuff, gold and silver, right? People come over, you're going to lay this nice spread. But then you've got these other things, wood and clay. And in the ancient world, they would often use wood and clay pots for garbage, rubbish, taking out the trash. And I'm just going to say it, human excrement, all right? Therefore, verse 21, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy. Which leads to my third characteristic of an approved worker, that an approved worker pursues holiness, set apartness. And if a person is set apart as holy, they will be useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So Paul is using another illustration to reinforce his point. Who are the gold and silver vessels in the house of the Lord? They are the ones who will be reckoned as approved workers. Who are the ones who would be considered wood or clay? They would be the false teachers, those who are promoting a false gospel, those who aren't cutting it and saying it straight, but those who are cutting swervy lines to suit their own fancies, namely Hymenaeus and Philemon, to name two. So there is this need in our lives to continuously be set apart for the purposes of God. And not be drawn into the temptations that we find in this world. To be set apart. And the fourth and final one is this. That an approved worker longs 
to see people saved or come into a saving relationship with the Lord. Now, the interesting context of this would allow you to write in your notes even one's enemies. An approved worker longs to see people saved and come into a saving relationship with Jesus. Even your enemies. Even the people who can't stand you. Who couldn't stand Timothy? Hymenaeus and Philemus. Who couldn't stand Paul? Hymenaeus and Philemus. So in verse 22, Paul says, So flee youthful passions. I'm going to give a couple of youthful passions that Timothy was called to flee. He was called not to be quarrelsome. The false teachers like an argument. Timothy is called, don't be quarrelsome. Be kind to everyone. Patiently endure evil. Look at the text. Flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels. And the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach, patiently enduring evil. What that doesn't mean is turning away from evil and pretending it doesn't exist. It means enduring the evil in an enemy of yours without becoming resentful. Think about that for a moment. Are there people in your relational realm that you quite honestly just resent? Paul knows that it would have been really easy for Timothy to become resentful towards Hymenaeus and Philetus because they're working against what he's working for. And it's really easy for us to become resentful against people who are working against what we are working for. But look what he continues to say. Verse 25, correcting his opponents with what? Gentleness. Why? God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth. As much as a pain as Hymenaeus and Philetus were for Paul, he still wanted to see them saved. As much as a, 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 a burr as they were in the saddle, so to speak, he still wanted them to be saved. Verse 26, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil after being captured by him to do his will. If you're having a hard time with this and maybe you're filled with resentment, I need you to think about one theological reality. That Christ died on the cross for you when you were enemies of God because of your own sin. Christ died for me on the cross when I was his enemy because of my sin. And what did Christ do in response to my sin? He demonstrated his love for me by dying on the cross. He demonstrated his kindness toward me and his patience and his forbearance through his death. He's a gentle Savior. And everyone in this room should be thankful for the gentleness of Jesus. For without that, we would not be here. And with as much of a conflict as there was in the church in Ephesus, and as serious as the issue was, Paul didn't say to Timothy, to Timothy go find these people and just blast them. What did he call Timothy to do? Live the life of Jesus in their presence. Let the Holy Spirit soften them and help them to see Christ in you because they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil. Paul understands the spiritual nature of the battle and that these people were really in the grips of the evil one. 
And the best way to lead them out is just to be the presence of Christ in their midst and long to see their salvation, even though they were enemies. And so this strikes right to the core of the cross. It strikes right to the core of how we are even able to be here today. Because Jesus has shown kindness and gentleness and patience with us. And Paul says, you want to be an approved worker? He says, really, really it's hard. Be gentle with the people who even hate you. Would you bow? Father, I thank you for the power of your word. I just pray that your word that has proceeded from my mouth as I have read this text this morning would be brought to life in our hearts in the ways that it needs to be brought to life, that there would be correction, there would be encouragement, there would be reproof, there would be teaching. Lord, my prayer for this church is that it would be a place where the word of God is rightly handled, rightly divided. We cut it straight and say it straight and allow your spirit to do what only your spirit can do. And that is to change lives and to save people from the grips of the devil. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Would you stand as we sing the doxology this morning? Amen.